Um, okay, guys, um, it's a great pleasure for us to uh, have here uh, Professor Vanderlei Banhato. Uh, Professor Vanderlei um, got his um, bachelor degrees, double bachelor degrees, from uh, University of uh, São Paulo and Federal University of uh, São Carlos, which is a city really close by, about uh, 200 ish kilometers from Campinas. They have a huge optics and photonic center there. Uh, Professor van der Leyen did, uh, got his PhD from uh, MIT in 1987 and uh, came back to Sao Paulo in, uh, in the early 90s, uh, starting a, a professor position there at the University of Sao Paulo in Sao Carlos. Uh, his research uh, is focused on, on laser cooling and trapping. Uh, and also, uh, more recently, let's say maybe the 15 years, he started also adventuring through biophotonics applications and made major contributions there as well. Um, so he's presently working on, on both science and condensate, time frequency metrology, and photodynamic therapies. That's the, the biology part. Um, and he has published over 300 papers, um, you know, many thousand citations, uh, graduated over 50 uh, students. And uh, Professor Vodelay has received as, uh, numerous awards, and I'd like to emphasize that he's also uh, he's, as a part of the uh, notorious club of the uh, Vatican uh, Academy of Science, you know, which includes uh, many Nobel Prizes. So, I, always, I was curious when I read that news, but I, I, I learned that it's a very prestige position. Uh, maybe he can clarify to us what, what they do there. Of course. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, uh, it's a great pleasure, Professor van der Leyen. We're going to twist a little bit gears here. Again, Professor van der Leyen is an atom trap expert. So I'm sure we're going to shift a little bit from what we've been learning over the past two days. Again, uh, thanks, Wunderly. Thank you. Well, maybe we should start to a mess because from that. <laughs> yeah. uh, is anybody here working with cold atoms somehow, trapping? You are. OK. All right. So. Um, First of all, I want to apologize. Some transparencies are in Portuguese, some are in English, but I don't think this will be a problem because uh, I will barely follow what's there. So I'll try to speak more, use the hands. And uh, what, what I planned was the following. Uh, presently, I'm working with two topics. Uh, including Bose-Einstein condensation, which is a way of producing macroscopic samples uh, with quantum behavior, superfluids, right? And uh, what I'm doing there, I'm doing one that's called quantum turbulence. What we're trying to do is use the atomic superfluid to study turbulence. It's turbulence, you know? And uh, this is, of course, uh, something that I'm very excited about. And one of the lectures will be dedicated to explain to you why anybody wants to go to the quantum world and study chaos, turbulence. OK? This will be tomorrow. Another thing we're doing is thermodynamics. You know, the old thermodynamics you know, that you learn in school canonical, grand canonical, very nice thing, right? <laughs> but uh, we want to study that in a situation that the system is not homogeneous. Suppose I have a gas. Of course, we're going to do everything quantum, because this is the sample we have to do in the lab. But uh, the density is not uniform. How can we do thermodynamics in this, in this limit? Can we extract the things? How out of equilibrium is this? I don't know if you already hear about the Gibbs-Zurich mechanism of quantum transition. I don't know if that applies already to nanoparticles. But always you have quantum transition, something going to the quantum world, like superfluid. Suppose I have a helium, and I start to cool down or pressurize. Or, uh, no, I have to uh, remove the pressure for going to the, to the lambda point, right? 
And then suddenly, that system, which is big, macroscopic, became a quantum, unique object. How that happens? That is very similar to what's happening inside the cavity of a laser, right? Suddenly, you have to start to make the modes to be populated in a way that everybody will be behaving the same. So you heavily populate one mode of a cavity. And then you have a, a light with very special properties, right? So here is the same. We want to know how a system undergoes a phase transition, becoming a macroscopic quantum object, single wave function, and all that stuff. How that happens? You nucleate parts that coalesce like crystals. What's happened there? And that is universal. People want try to apply that from astrophysics to superfluid, to atoms inside a bottle. And uh, I want to stick a little bit with that because uh, that's the main concern. You know, we are in the quantum age. You know, devices, everything is trying very hard to take the advantages of quantum mechanics. You all know that, right? That's why you want to go to very tiny little objects, scattering light and everything, because there things are a little bit delicate, like plasmonics, right? Light interacting with nanostructures, metallic is a little different, and so on. So I want to expand some of that in the first lecture tomorrow, and then the second one will be about this thermodynamics, how all this thing happens. Because thermodynamics is a, a part of uh, physics uh, dedicated to the connection between the macroscopic world to the macro world. You know, people didn't know what was motion of atom and molecules, and then they came with the idea of temperature. That's very nice. And uh, they don't know how molecules and atoms exchange momentum with uh, a container. They came with the idea of pressure, right? How can we do that for systems that are not uniform? Can we build up a new type of uh, thermodynamics? This is my last lecture. And uh, because we are just doing that. And then I want to touch a little bit something about universality. Science, uh, we, we don't like things that only happens in one single point of the universe. Physics like things that happens everywhere, right? We have to create laws. We, ha we like to create things that can be applied anywhere. This is what we do, right? If I take an optical property that's only valid for a specific single molecule, that's not uh, so exciting. You're going to go measure key 5 there, and that's it. Discover that that's a related symmetry of that specific guy, and that's it. We learn it that guy. We, we don't like. We like to learn uh, like... Uh, uh, in Portuguese, there is a word. It's called varejo and atacado. I don't know the translation <laughs> to English. Please help the colleagues that only speak English. Physics like to go to the atacado. Like, we like big supermarkets. Gross, gross, gross market. Gr gross, gross market. Gross market. <laughs> you know, we like people to go and see shelves filled with things. Oh, I need this. Oh, I need that. The guy doesn't know how he's going to cook, but he knows everything is there, right? <laughs> that thing is, helps to cook anything. This is what physics like. We like to create tools that are general. We all know that, right? So uh, this is what I'm going to do in the thermodynamics, explain a little bit about universality, which is a topic that gave many Nobel Prizes to many people, Wilson and many others. and. Um, very little explored in the laboratory. S is turbulence. Turbulence is one of the challenges that we know almost nothing. But today is different. I have to teach you some of the concepts. How many of you know about scattering length? Nobody? <clears throat> ah, you know. OK. So I'm going to explain some basic things. So in my two lectures of tomorrow, 
if you if you know everything that I'm going to start to say, you you can go take a coffee, bring one for us, <laughs> and uh, tomorrow you'll be okay. Because uh, I want to start to show you in the quantum mechanics sense when atoms interact with each other, what kind of concepts we have to build up and okay. And then there is a quiz. Tomorrow I should come a little early for a quiz. And the student that passed the quiz is going to get a prize, a real prize. It's not a, a kind of virtual prize, it's a real one. I will bring in a, in a big envelope, it has to be big. So I'm going to São Carlos tomorrow, I bring my big envelope with a big prize to give it to the big student. Okay, so uh, I'm going to speak concepts because this maybe is an audience that uh, uh, never really stop to think about cooling, trapping. So I'm going to give you some ideas, okay? So this first lecture has to be very relaxed. You can raise your hand anytime. You can stop. You can exchange an idea. I will be, will be okay. But I want to introduce myself. I work in São Carlos, and so those guys here, you know, they are three, my neighbors. And uh, we are a center of FAPESP. FAPESP here in Sao Paulo create a few centers. I'm one of those. And the center uh, cannot uh, be focused in a tiny little object. We have to use optics for more than... So we do atomic physics, which we like a lot. We have an atomic clock. In fact, we have three. And then we work with cold atoms. We have a few laboratories in cold atoms, some in my lab, some in the other labs, like uh, Marcasa. Uh, no student of Marcasa is here, right? But like the group of photons, where they do nonlinear optics and so on. So we do, in the atomic physics, we work with cold atoms. And, uh, we do two things. One is to study how light interact with atoms in a regime where the recoil of the photon makes a big difference, right? And uh, we even did a two photon, two atoms some days ago, right? Years ago. Years ago. Years ago. Three years ago. Three years ago. And you're very happy because yeah. we mentioned a lot your paper. Yeah. And that was very important because it was our prediction 23 years ago. We, we published our theoretical <laughs> papers. <laughs> we yeah. published our theoretical papers, and it was the first time that someone saw in a, in a guess the fact that they were. <laughs> and then you have to continue that that collection of papers generate a new uh, uh, topic that they are pursuing in France, in many groups, which is when you have two atoms seeing each other and they come interact with the light, and they absorb two photons, but two atoms absorbing two photons. It's not a molecule, it's different. Atoms coming together, absorb two photons, and fly away. And each one carry part of the two photons, and then they emit, and the claim is that those emitted photons are correlated in different frequencies, and those atoms are also correlated. So maybe we can think about the entanglement and that kind of, right? I have to correct because it was about 23 years ago. It was 30 years, 33 years ago. Oh, oh, it's getting old here. <laughs> See, you the first. You did the first paper, so. But you, unfortunately, I, I'm not going to talk about that. But I love that topic, because you see, uh, I know that Sid is very enthusiastic on nonlinear optics and things like this and and one object absorbing many fo Sorry. <laughs> These people don't know that we are lecturing. <laughs> oh boy. Just a second. Okay. Sorry. Problem. I was waiting his phone call because I was a little late. Uh, where were we? Ah, you see, 
Everything we do in nonlinear optics, just pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> Everything we know in nonlinear optics, people treat locally. So CD can build up all the properties of his solid, composing of uh, individual properties. He go and take the levels of a single ion and so on. If you have a quantum fluid, we call many body system. Many body system is not like the ones that CD described. We cannot build up properties based only in a property of a single atom. Now we have to start to think about how many atoms behave together. And we are interested in doing many photon interaction with many body systems. And two atoms, two photons is the first step, is the first element. If we take a many body system Hamiltonian and interact with light, uh, the first element that comes is two atoms interacting with two photons for nonlinear. And then three, four, and then many atoms and two photons. This is what we want to do. And this cooperative type of thing that CD and Rius put together is a. Uh, we, we know very little about quantum macroscopic system and light. This is still a very open subject in many sense, right? Time goes. OK. So we do, and then bio, we, we do a lot of things interacting. Everything we do with atoms, we go and do inside cells. And nanoplasmonic, which is maybe the closest thing to you, but I'm not doing that. So I feel very shaking doing, speaking about that. And then we do diffusion. Maybe we are the only physics group in the, in the world that holds a TV channel. If you go to São Carlos, you turn on the TV, channel 10. <laughs> You're going to get lectures. It's not true. You're going to get uh, seminars. You're going to get uh, interviews 24 hours a day. Yeah, and we do innovation because uh, we believe that uh, some of things we do can be used for generating money. You know, we are big consumers of money. Me, Sid, Gustav, everybody. Sometimes we put our step on the other line to help to produce. And uh, innovation, everything. This is the group. And uh, is uh, quite big. We have today in São Carlos 120 people. And collecting all the collaborators, we are getting close to uh, 170. Uh, sorry, that's in Portuguese, but my idea here was to show you that uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, concerning about uh, the uh, stream of temperature on the high side. Very, very hot stuff, because we believe there is the origin of uh, matter, there is the formation of many things, right? So we are very worried about and. Uh, but uh, we are living in a world that's much colder than the beginning. But maybe we want to go to the other stream now. Because the, the top stream has no limit. What is the maximum limit temperature you can go? I don't know. But what is the minimum temperature you can go? Zero. So this limit is very. Uh, interesting, because uh, there is a, a wall there. You know, some people say we can cross. It's a dangerous. We don't know, but uh, we are learning a lot of things getting close to that. And uh, you see, big advances of modern science happens trying to go to the limit of low temperature. Of course, there are more examples of advance of science going to the high temperature limit than to the low, but the low is always very nice. You know, and uh, it helps many things. Uh, I put the ice, gelo means ice in Portuguese. So if you go today to the cafeteria, ask a caipirinha, don't ask a caipirinha with ice. You have to ask a caipirinha with gelo, because in Portuguese, gelo is ice. If you ask with ice, that is a drink, it's called ice. Put that in the cachaça, that's a waffle mis mixture. Don't do that. So anyway, we are here. 
10 to the minus 6 Kelvin. You know, we all learn in school that uh, you cannot go to zero. This is not really true. Uh, maybe we can. With a few atoms embedded in many, we can make it go. And people like Ketterly MIT, he's trying to, he's already 10 to the minus 11 of Kelvin. I know 10 to the minus 11 is not zero. Yeah, but it's 10 to the minus 11, right? <laughs> it's much less. Can you imagine 10 to the minus 11? It's like imagine 10 to the 20, right? In one end, the other end, it's impossible to imagine Big Bang temperature. It's also impossible to imagine with our day-by-day -day vision 10 to the minus 11. But this is where we are. A little bit more. I'm going to tell you tomorrow experiments that happens on the 10 to the minus 9 to 10 to the minus 8 Kelvin, which is the regime of uh, Bose condensation. Okay. Okay. So how you, the, the thing is when we get so cold, as you know, momentum. Oh, by the way, temperature for me is momentum. Okay. We are talking about the kinetic of gases that you learn in high school. So KT for me is P square divided by 2M if you want, or you can make it M1. So uh, this is where we are. When you cool down, you all learn in school, momentum is slow down, gets very small, and then the de Broglie wavelength, which is the quantum parameter we use to see how is the behavior of the system grows up because uh, the de Broglie wavelength is h bar divided by momentum. h bar is still the scale, still the size of the quantum world, right? But the quantum, the world has dimension. And whatever lambda is compatible with that dimension, thinks behavior is strange. So if I start to cool down things, suddenly I cannot speak anymore about the trajectory. I have to speak about wave function. And I cannot speak about uh, density adding particles. I have to speak about density as psi square. Right? This is the regime we're going to work. And uh, what's very interesting is that when you get to that regime, imagine that uh, here we have uh, a gas. And uh, instead of this normal Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, we now have waves. Waves has to obey some boundary conditions. They go to zero at the wall. Otherwise, they have to penetrate. So density suddenly has to go to zero to the walls. And the pressure, if I take all the gas of this room, cool down, cool down, when they all became waves, suddenly there is a change in macroscopic properties. Because as I told you, pressure, volume, temperature are all macroscopic quantities. And then things behave differently. Oh, uh, normally, you know, this is a scale for you to see. I'm going to speak a, a little bit about how we get through all this. Not all, but what is this Doppler cooling about? How can we keep atoms from escape if they are very slow motion? Optical molasses, magnetic trap, and then what is this concept of evaporation? And again, I apologize if some of you knows about this. Uh, but the problem is for the lectures of tomorrow, we, we want to build up some of this. So this is my temperature. And uh, let me first explain to you how everything is, how can we remove motion from atoms, right? Because normally, people like CD, they don't care about, they don't care about momentum. They care about energy. I never saw CD including his matrix elements, H bar K. Doesn't exist. He only care about H bar omega. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. He care about energy exchange. But uh, we care about the momentum exchanges, the other part of light falling relativity, right? Energy, momentum has to be together. Energy, CP, you cannot uh, take apart. That is momentum. 
And then when you interact light with atoms, the energy is right, and there are many ways of making energy to go in. One, two, three photons. What's your limit now, Oxidi? <laughs> Last time was seven. Key seven. Now you are where? That's okay, mice. Okay. But for momentum, it's the same because each, each photon that's absorbed, it's energy that you exchange with any, anything in terms of light. Momentum is also transfer, right? We learned that. And then if I am uh, smart enough, I can make uh, photons to be absorbed in the, against a motion of an atom. And then I, at the same time that I excite and the atoms emit, I also slow down because uh, it's like uh, shooting against motion. So I remove momentum as well, okay? So this is the principle. This gave the Nobel Prize to Teddy Hensch in the very origin, and then Bill Phillips. And so this is the idea. We use this, and then we do a lot of engineering to make sure that atoms can absorb a lot of photon, because a photon you know, is very tiny momentum. And an atom is a massive object traveling with uh, 1,000 meters per second. If you take the momentum of a photon, and a an regular atom of mass 20, the photon can only change about one centimeter per second of the atom. But an atom has a thousand kilometers per second. And you need a huge amount of photon. And worse than that, atom only sees photon if the photon is right for him. So if the atom is moving, the Doppler shift makes the atoms blind to some photons, right? If the Doppler shift is much bigger, oh, the atom doesn't care. So when you're slowing down an atom, you send light, absorbs a little bit, and then doesn't care anymore, goes away. That's why CD doesn't care. Because after absorbing a few photons, change it doesn't make a difference. But for us, make. Because I have to make an atom to absorb 10 to the 9 photons to come to rest. And this is what we do. We create uh, ways to calculate the force that atoms can feel when interact with light. And uh, you see, the relations are very similar to any relation you can do about the energy exchange, because uh, basically what I do is, what is the resonance curve of an atom interacting with light? And then I multiply by h bar. This gives me the probability of absorption. I multiply by h bar k divided by the time that the atoms takes to absorb and emit this photon. This is called radiation pressure. Okay? An atom, as you know, we have the orbitals of the electron, and when the electromagnetic field comes, oh, they are framing. I'm moving like this. Is that okay? I hope so. I'm going to stay here. No, he's not going to be what? <laughs> Stay here. <laughs> oh, he moves off it. <laughs> you see, another thing is, I told you about energy exchange and force. I hope you understand. There is a absorbed momentum. In average, what's interesting is, if I have an atom, I send the light in one direction. It absorbs and emits to all directions. All directions contribute to zero momentum, right? But the absorption is in a single direction. So I get a net force in that direction. This is radiation pressure. But the atom has a movable charge. We all know that the electron can be in different orbitals and things like this. So whatever comes by electromagnetic field, the first thing is, oh, this orbital can change. So you easily can move things a little bit around. Even though you don't have a lot of energy, you can move the orbitals. When I say move the orbital means I create superposition of other orbitals, right? And then it happens that uh, the negative charge and the positive charge displace a little bit, so I have a kind of dipole. This is called induced dipole because only happens when an electromagnetic field comes nearby, even though it's not the resonant frequency. Understand? 
So we have a dipole force that we call induced force. This is not the radiation pressure. It's a dipole force. And the dipole force needs that the field in different places be different. Then I need a gradient of intensity of light, which means a gradient on the electrical field. So those are the two forces. One is I send a photon, and by absorption, I remove momentum. And the other one, which you imagine, is not very good for transferring momentum, but is a conservative force. It's good for confining things. Because I have an arm, if it is low enough, I put a gradient of uh, electrical field of the radiation. And then I can produce a force towards the point of space that I want. It's good for creating trouble. So those are the two forces I'm not going to go. But people use this, like when I focus a laser beam, I have a gradient in how many directions? First the question of the quiz. In all directions. Because if I have a Gaussian beam, I focus it. The intensity is high is lower here and higher here, lower again. So I have a gradient along Z. Right? And transversely, I have the Gaussian profile, so I have a gradient. So if it turns out that I put an arm in there, and the arm has the correct, uh, let's say, induced dipole, the arm stays in that focus. You understand? Because I have a gradient, if I induce dipole, I have dipole force. And this is essential for us, because uh, this is a way of creating optical lattices, for instance, which is a good uh, interface of cold atoms with condensed matter, right? Today we can put atoms in a regular lattice, and we can study those things that we learn in solid state. It's true if atoms make transition, if suddenly they delocalize and things like this. Another one is if I put two beams now, suppose I have an atom that is resonant, or near resonant with light, and I put light, red shifted to the transition. Right? I'm red shifted to the transition, but I have light coming from both directions. In principle, if this atom is stopped, it sees the same probability to absorb both beams. So in terms of momentum transmission, it's equal. I have no choice. I can absorb light from this or from this. Net force is zero. But suppose I'm moving that way. Then that, that beam that's red shifted from my transition became blue shifted for me because Doppler effect. So if I start to move, I like to absorb more this beam than that one. So these guys start to absorb, transfer more momentum. Then I stop. These guys start to push me, and then comes the other one. So because of combination of a Doppler shift and absorption, I can create a viscous force for atoms with light. And this is called optical molasses. Molasses, right? And this gave the Nobel Prize to Stephen Shu. So when I send an atom in the correct configuration of light, light atoms start to lose energy. And how, what is that energy going? Where's that energy going? OK, let me explain. The atom absorbs either this direction or that direction. Depends if it's moving that way or that way. So I, I can prove to you that I have a force which is proportional to minus velocity. It's viscous force, right? But turns out that I absorb it from this, and I emit it to everywhere. So for physicists, I take atoms from this very well-organized beam and send it to all the modes of the universe. This is heat to the universe. And the atom cools down. You understand the refrigerator, how it works? So what is the cold? What is the cold source? And what is the hot source in a mechanism like this? This is one of the quiz for the price of tomorrow in the big envelope. Think a little bit. Because if I, am a, if I have a refrigerator, everybody tells me I have to have a cold source and a hot source. 
So who is the cold source? Who is the hot source? The laser beams here, is the hot or the cold? And the, the, all the modes of the universe, is the hot or the cold source? OK, you think a little bit. So this is the force. I throw an atom, I have a damping force. If I make the right engineering, I can cool down. And this is very efficient. I can bring an atom from room temperature to nano Kelvin. So it's very efficient, right? It's a very good damping. And uh, what we see in the lab, we put this, if I put a vapor, this is a sodium vapor, and I put light. Of course, I, 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 I did for you one dimension, but you remember the 3D oscillators, they add up, right? Imagine that atoms can see independently light from both directions, which is not true, right, Sid? It's not true. I may use this to saturate another transition. People do that all the time in nonlinear optics. Then it's, but, but if I forget about this, I imagine that they are independent. It's like a ball connected to six strings and with damping. So the atoms damping down, OK? Am I clear? OK, thank you. So when I turn on lights in a vapor, atoms start to collapse in the center, in the crossing of this, because they feel a damping force anywhere they want to go. This is the optical molasses. But optical molasses, you know, if I put um, honey in here and I throw a big amount of uh, ants, they all come, when they get to the molasses, to the, to the honey, they slow down and they start to accumulate there, right? In fact, this is a for cockroach. You have a kind of glue, cockroaches go, and they go very slowly there. The same happens here. But where are they located? Everywhere. Whatever there is dumping, they can stay. To solve this problem, we add a magnetic field. We make the space not equal everywhere. We create a gradient of magnetic field. And if you put two coils, that is only one point of zero field, right? And uh, when magnetic field is present, I have to add one more element to this, which are the selection rules. Then by using, if I put a, a, a field in the space, then uh, I determine a direction that's different from the others. We learn it from high school that that is a good quantization direction. And angular momentum and everything is referred to that direction. Then by putting light with angular momentum, I can select states of the atom. Because atom is not a two-level system. Normally, it's a multiple-level system. And in the presence of magnet field, they open up. And then I have now a force that is viscous. And by having a zero field, I have a restoring force. So I create what they call magneto-optical trap, right? That uh, is very important. So when I have the molasses, you saw atoms were there. Let me go back. But you know, they are not really there. They are there. This is more intense. But yeah, they are here. They, everywhere I can see things they are. But when I add a field, with two coils, that's the best way of adding grad gradient, right? It's putting what they call anti-Helmholtz coil. You create the gradients of field. You localize the atoms because now not only you have a Doppler depending on the velocity direction, but you have also a selection due to the position. And to make a zero point is the zero field. I'm not going to elaborate a lot on this, but this is... Uh, a very important uh, issue on cold atoms because it was the first time we could localize the cold atoms. That ball is the same of before. I just turn on the field and I have uh, 1 billion atoms at temperature of 1 micro Kelvin just by doing this simple engineering. You see, doing cold atoms is much simpler than doing nanophotonic. That's why we have a few open positions for graduate students <laughs> and postdocs. 
is easier, you can relax, publish, and there are work available. I, I, I should say very tiny. You know? <laughs> Hopefully, there are work available. <laughs> no, but it's, 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 you see, making this, when I was a graduate student, took us ten, five years. Now, if you go to the lab, you do this in five days. So we are much more advanced than you. Today, to do the glasses and things takes, oh, you need to have one guy that prepare glasses with nanoparticles, the other one that do this. Here, you can do everything in a single table. Well, OK. But see, you, you see, my sample is very bright, right? Why is very bright? Because my refrigerator is on all the time. I'm taking light from the beams and send it to the world. And you see. So it means I have a constantly interaction of atoms and light. And the atom is shaking like crazy because it's getting momentum from different directions. In average, is there. But it's not what I want. I want quiet. I want to take the light. So what we do then? We use another property of the atoms, which is the spin. Spin is a tiny magnet, right? And uh, if I work well, I can create a minimum of magnetic field in space, right? And do you all, you all know that we can create either minimum or maximum of field in space free of current, right? Everybody knows? Who doesn't know this? You know? No, no. No, let me tell you something. In a space free of current, you can only create minimum of magnetic field, never maximum. It's a, something that's embedded in the Maxwell law, in the Maxwell equations. It's a very nice exercise to prove that the amplitude of a magnetic field cannot be maximum in a place that has no current. Right. But minimum I can. And if you remember, some levels of the atoms due to the spin, the interaction with magnetic field, Stan Gerlach, everybody passed to that lecture once. There are levels that grows up with field. There are levels that doesn't care when the spin is perpendicular, the state is perpendicular to the magnetic field, right? And there are states that goes down with the amplitude of the magnetic field. So imagine that I have an atom in this state means that to, to walk field up, I need energy. And this energy is converted in the structure of the atom, of course, because but it, I need. So if I put an atom here, it wants to stay to the minimum of magnetic field. And that's the way we trap atoms. We put atoms in a state that wants to stay in the minimum. So this is magnetic trapping. And, uh, some people got Nobel Prize. <laughs> so simple. OK, now, what is the biggest field you can create on the Earth? This is a relevant question for physicists. What do you think is the biggest magnetic field man can create? OK, let me start by asking you, do you know what's the magnet Earth field? What is the value? Come on. We, we, if you don't know, just say. Uh, 20 gauss. How, how much? OK, it's the order of a gauss, right? Half a gauss. That's the order of the magnetic field if we measure here. And we all know that one Tesla is 10 to the 4 gauss. The largest magnetic field man can create is about uh, in a CW, is about 12 Tesla. And uh, in a pulsed level, 60 Tesla. And then uh, the magnetic field time the spin, which is basically the Bohr magneton, right? Give me energy, which is the, how high is the barrier to hold this atom. And if I ask, what is the field I need for some uh, atom velocity, typical atom velocity, you see? To trap atoms that are at the room temperature, I need 2,000 Tesla. 
This is a neutron star type of field. I have to take a shuttle, go near a neutron star, build my atoms there, then they stay. So, see that to keep atoms in space only by magnetic field, I need to cool them down. And uh, this is what we do. Cool them down. Once they are cooled by light, we turn off, create a magnetic field, they stay there. Everybody understood this part? So tomorrow when I speak about magnet trap, is this what I'm talking about? Now, atoms interact each other. Like us, right? Sometimes I don't want to see people, but I see. I guess it's something intrinsic. <laughs> right? I want to avoid people, but it's intrinsic. We interact. So atoms interact. When I put them together, they interact. I'm going to go fast to this part. And uh, there are potentials depending, because you, you all know that uh, atoms interact through exchange of light. And light exchange uh, basically depending on the charge configuration. So if you have an atom in a S state, which is symmetric, or in a P state, they interact differently. And we learned this in quantum mechanics when we learned about molecules. And this is very important because uh, I, I, I work very hard to cool down the atoms. And then I want to send a little light to see them. But when they see this potential here, this is the potential between atoms. This is basically flat, is the van der Waals, only manifest when atoms get very close. But if I have a gas, they are not so close. But if, if I send a photon, I send one atom to P, a long range interaction starts to be. And since it can be attractive, I heat up the sample again. They boom, they want to stay together. And uh, this is a little more complicated because they have a hyperfine structure. And uh, well, I'm going to jump to this all. But now let's take the light and atom interaction. Light is called light assisted atomic collision in the cold. Uh, Cold regime is a very important thing. It's, it's through those interactions that we can uh, understand. Uh, oh, this is very interesting. Uh, long ago, we did an uh, uh, experiment because uh, you all learned that uh, you have two atoms, they come, make a molecule. We learned in high school that there is reactants, something, and then there is products. And then they, they call a, a coordinated, that they call reaction coordinated. Did you try to ask your chemistry teacher what's that re coordinate? He never gonna know. Because that's something create because they don't know what are the intermediate state of the formation of a molecular orbital. Because there is no time to do that. Put the atoms together. But in the cold regime, you can just watch the formation of a chemical orbital. And on the beginning of the 90s, this was very common. And everybody in cold atoms were trying to understand uh, chemistry. And if you look, you're too young, but if you look, there are many papers. We wrote a review of modern physics on cold collisions because it uh, was very interesting. Because in this regime, it's so nice that you can, prevent, you can control interaction of atoms using light without the atoms really interact with the light. Is amazing. But let's forget about that. Let's change gears a little bit. And now I have two atoms, no light, and they're going to collide. You all have this idea how they collide. You have a good idea about cross sections, I hope. Everybody has intuitions and everything. But suppose those atoms are very cold, and I cannot really localize them. They are waves traveling. How they collide? How I quantify this collision? How I quantify collision of waves? You remember from high school? Interference, right? What's important in interference? Amplitude and phase. That's everything quantum mechanics care about, amplitude and phase. So when two atoms come together, we're going to imagine now a last collision. It turns out that uh, they, they are very far apart. They are a very wonderful plane wave. And then they 
start to see each other. Maybe they don't want, but they see each other. This can be either attractive or repulsive. You agree? What's happened if I'm looking at this atom? I send an atom. He's going to meet your partner and then come back to me. What's happened to the phase of this atom if he interacts or not with another atom? It changes. If it is attractive, this guy is, is going to spend less time together. You're going to say, oh, but it's, it's attractive. He's going to spend more time. No. Attraction accelerates the atoms. Make the atoms moving fast. Advance the phase. If it is repulsion, the atom slows down. Expand more time in the interaction. The phase is retarded. So basically, all the interaction with quantum objects is on this phase stuff. So all that experiment we learned, scattering and everything, when two atoms interact, we know that uh, this scattering part related to the incident part may be dephased. This is everything that happens. All the interaction is done by phase. You understand? And we call this, in the first year of me quantum mechanics, phase shift. Yeah. Can you explain that again, the phase shift? Explain why does it advance in one case and it doesn't? Because uh, if, uh, you see, I have a plan wave. Can you imagine? Oh, this guy here is a plan wave. Let's imagine everybody's regular. He's a little bit. OK, plan wave. And they are traveling. Imagine they are traveling. And then I, I'm stopping here. And I'm looking this amplitude. But uh, now there is an attraction here. I'm looking that amplitude. Because there is attraction, I as when I'm passing by this attractor, I accelerate, right? So this guy is going to get to me early or late. Early. And then the f it's like the phase advance. You understand? It's like I take this whole plane wave and whoop. So this is positive phase shift. Now, if it is a repulsion, repulsion, this guy decelerates, right? And then this guy going to delay retardation. You understand me? So all the interaction is phase shift. And uh, quantum mechanics do not like uh, uh, the law of phase shift, but they want to put a number. They have to come with a number, length, right? An angle is only good when you're dealing with sinus and cosines. They like, ang they like distance. So they convert the phase in a distance by looking this, and they convert in something that we call scattering length. And I am sure you learn, if you have taking quantum mechanics, scattering, you have to learn this. Because uh, the phase is converted in a distance, which is called scattering length. If it is positive, means because the phase is the opposite of the scattering length. Where is my phase? Oh, I think I, phase, I didn't put, oh, I'm sorry. The phase is, is opposite to the, to the advance and the retardation. And then comes this negative. And the wave function has this. So what we like is characterize all the interaction of particles that cannot be treated as mass particles, but as wave, as a distance. It's called scattering length. OK? And this is true, of course, when if you remember a little bit about scattering, we normally uh, express the scattering amplitude that f of theta in terms of uh, spherical harmonics. And uh, if you have a very tight momentum, which we are interested in, slow collisions, we call only L equal to zero is important because uh, if L is one, means I have to somehow passing near this guy. My momentum time in this distance has to be about h bar. If it is much less than that, L equals to 1 is scattering. Right? Scattering is important. All what I'm telling happens in the, when you scatter light, too, in some sense. But this is scattering atoms against atoms. So 
Scattering length is the parameter to characterize scattering when you need to treat in the quantum world. You understand? Am I being too simple? Who is getting very tired here? Raise your hands. I have also a price for the tire. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm very, very democratic. I, I just got a student from Iran, and he bought, me, he bought me a bag of pistachio. Pistachio from Iran is wonderful. And uh, tomorrow I'm going to give about 100 grams inside that big envelope that has a big price for a big student with another big things and pistachio. OK, so this is called the scattering length. And then once you know this is basically the amplitude of the scattering, right? It's the thing that characterize. This is represents, because I convert phase shift in length. And then uh, I, my time is almost over. So I have to go very fast. It turns out that uh, if I control, you see the, the, the scattering length depends on the interaction, right? If it is a strong interaction, the phase shift may be bigger or shorter. Who is the next? OK, CD. Uh, can, I, can I buy 10 minutes? I give a wonderful calcite crystal. You know, CD doesn't sell himself for money, but for crystals, believe me. For a good UV calcite, I, you, you give it half of your hand, right? OK, then you already know something that's very important that's called flashback resonance. Because uh, I can control the interaction of the atoms with external fields, I can control the scattering length. You understand? It's the elastic scattering that I can control very well. So I can make uh, atoms to interact very big, long range, or very short range by controlling external fields. And with this, I can make samples where the interaction goes. He is interacting with the other guy in the other corner. He is interacting, but he, if he is interacting with that one, he interacts with everybody. This is what characterizes the many body system, the strong correlated system, which is, you know, a serious physics in nowadays. And, okay. So, you know everything. Tomorrow, when I speak about uh, putting fields to change interaction, you know what it means. OK, then comes the Bose condensation. But I think I am uh, halfway to what I thought I would be. You can understand that I am a real Italian. <laughs> I speak a lot, meaning nothing. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, I, now I was going just to tell you a little bit about Bose condensation. But you know, you know that. Uh, uh, just to simplify everything, you know everything about laser, God, right? What is laser for normal light? If I ask you to tell me, what is a laser for a thermal light? What are you going to answer? Come on, guys, you are quantum opticians. Is what? Is? Is? Condensate. If you see a single state, Well, you know that. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's right. You're from where? India. India. Oh, you're a friend of Bose. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, you all have this intuition, I'm sure, that the laser for normal light means order, coherence, Single phase, about the same. A lot of common properties for the, all the components of that field, right? We normally say that uh, a single mode of that field is fully occupied. It's not chance. A single mode, right? OK, the BC is exactly the same. Because if you think about waves for atoms, it's the same. Suddenly, I have a thermal gas. What is a thermal gas in your mind? A mess. You know, it's a nightclub at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> After a lot of things happen, <laughs> nobody knows where to go, to do what. 
It's just casual. <laughs> I like the casual. <laughs> it's a good word. <laughs> you meet, you don't know who and don't know where. Now, suddenly this change. Boom. Like a laser for the thermal light. Everybody with the same clothes, the girls with the same makeup, the boys with the same shoes. We don't care, right? It's not like them. If they see two with the same shoes, it's, it's, it's exclusion. Shoes are fermions. <laughs> For girls. For boys, no. It's, it's even nice. Oh, look. If it was two girls, <laughs> she hired. <laughs> anyway, OK, now I forgot. <laughs> so when I, I, I make this gas behave like a laser, I have a condensate. Of course, for the atoms, I cannot speak about propagation mode or anything. I speak about uh, levels of energy of a confining potential. OK? And this is the condensate. So it's a change. So we use it to say that the condensate is for gas or for atoms, what laser is for normal light, thermal light. Good? OK, because tomorrow we'll be able to see how we measure things in the condensate. This is cold. And a thermometer that doesn't like to go that cold. You know, you cannot go to Radio Shack or, and say, oh, can you give me a thermometer of Nano Kelvin? <laughs> they don't have yet. We have to rely on the definition of temperature, which is expansion. And this is the way we measure. So we are able to measure very cold. And uh, this is, we want to go even colder. But we cannot put light because we are in a situation that the momentum of the atoms is much, 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 much less than the momentum of the photon. If I put them together, I'm going to make a mess again. You agree? So I have to come with new ideas of cooling. And then we do evaporation. I'm almost the end. Uh, and the evaporation, you know, you all know, of course, Physicist, first thing in the morning is the coffee and a little blow on the smoke make the liquid colder. Why? Ah, you know that. Ah, you know. <laughs> Why I blow the smoke of the coffee and the liquid gets colder? No, no, I'm not putting heat. I'm just removing mass. I'm blowing the smoke, you know, the little fog on the top. That happens because the fog, the little smoke on the top of the coffee, are the liquid molecules with a lot of energy. That's why they detach from the liquid. And they are flying around. They became vapor. Of course, then they coalesce in tiny little drops. That's why you see. Otherwise, you don't even see the smoke. And when you take that away, the system will replace. But they're going to replace the distribution. They're going to produce hotter atoms to go. A thermalization takes place. And those atoms are taking energy away. So evaporation is a process where I remove from a system the hottest components, and everything gets cold. If I allow the system to re-thermalize. Understand? If I go to a nightclub, there are always a few guys very happy, right? And if I remove those guys, then you can go back and dance tango again. If they are in the saloon, you cannot, because they are too excited. Those are the hot atoms. So evaporation happens even in the nightclub. And that's the way we make things very cold. And the way we remove is something interesting. And I think I'm going to stop here and explain to you how anybody can calculate what's happening in that system. So this was my introduction lecture. Give you a few concepts. I would like to give more, but uh, I had a lot of more, but I, I don't think I can go now. But tomorrow we can just pass very fast to this and uh, go to the. I hope I was not very simple. For the ones that knew everything, I'm sorry. I hope you don't think I'm so stupid. I'm a little bit stupid, but uh, that's a... tomorrow we can build up.
these concepts, and uh, I want to start with a condensate, produce vorticities, see how that evolves, and try to explain to you how important it is to understand the turbulence. It will be my first. The second, how can we describe those things with thermodynamics? Thank you. If you have a good question or a bad question, 